I switched providers um, when the Enbrel stopped working for me. Mm -hmm. The next gal I went to see, she was fine. Mm -hmm. um, mostly we were both just frustrated by um, finding an alternative that would work for mm -hmm. me. So at that point I did go on some oral methotrexate, right. started adding some of the sulfasalazine, mm -hmm. plaquenil, and then the cocktail began. I hadn't been on the cocktail before. Right. Um, so then the cocktail began and the fiddling with dosage began. Went on Humira instead. Okay. That was the next one we went to. Um, which again worked for a little bit. So once mm -hmm. I, I found another biologic that worked, it was a couple years on, on Humira. Mm -hmm. um, and then I moved. Um, got a new rheumatologist here mm -hmm. who is my rheumatologist still. Okay. And uh, she is lovely. Um, and, and we're still working together to, um, to figure out the, the medications that are working best for me. I did do Remicade for a while, yeah. um, which was working all right. I will tell you, I really enjoyed it, frankly, yeah. because of just the frequency of having to go for an infusion. And basically, yeah. um, I had to go into a mental space where it was like a spa day. I would yeah. just go yeah. and they dose me with Benadryl. So I just take a nap and a lazy boy and nice. be done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. My husband and I decided that we wanted to have a baby. And um, I, I have since heard that I might have been able to stay on Remicade, but my uh, rheumatologist did not recommend that I do. This, and this goes to what do I wish that yeah. um, medical providers were aware of. I, I understand that women of childbearing age and interest may be in a minority of their patients, mm -hmm. but our needs are complex yeah. and the science is changing regularly yeah. and i wish that they had the interest and and the capacity i mean i'm sure they're all overworked i know about yes. the the shortage of rheumatologists in this country but i wish that they had the capacity to keep abreast of these changes in the science because um being on nothing mm -hmm. for um except my plaquenil and my um prednisone while oh, yeah. The, in the initial stages of my pregnancy were extremely difficult. Yeah. Um, could not walk up and down stairs. Wow. Normally I was having, you know, it was, it was bad. Oh. <laughs> I wouldn't have even been on prednisone if it were for the fact that I had reached out to the experts at Mother to Baby oh, okay. for the latest research on okay. the effects of prednisone early in pregnancy and, dur and during pregnancy because um, there had been like preliminary results of uh, earlier studies had shown an increased risk of cleft palate oh, okay. for prednisone use in the first trimester. Oh, okay. But more recent research had disproven that oh. and my rheumatologist wasn't aware of that. Yeah. What I'm very happy about, though, is that she was open to it and that right. mother to baby providing me the actual peer-reviewed research that I could pass off to her, not just, right. I read on the internet that yes. it's okay, yes. but here are the peer-reviewed articles that show that it is safe. What are some, in general, tips you might have for developing a good relationship with your providers? Like It sounds like having that open communication, having them trust you that you can bring articles to them that you're not just going to bring like some random thing from the internet but it's actually yeah peer reviewed that's probably helpful for your relationship i'm guessing but are there any other tips for other patients i learned through my initial experience with my primary care provider mm -hmm. through my first rheumatologist that the importance of someone who is really hearing you is mm -hmm. second to none like yes. that is the most important thing that when you have a symptom or you have a concern that you can express it freely and know that the person on the other side is being completely receptive to what you're saying. They might yeah. not agree with whatever suggestion you might have, but that, right. but that they're actually taking in that information. And that seems like a basic thing, yeah. right? <laughs> but it is not. <laughs> no, I totally, totally agree with you. If okay. I wasn't comfortable advocating for myself, you better be sure I was bringing someone with me to my appointments yes. who could advocate for me or to at least just provide that um, emotional support for me to feel more comfortable 
advocating for right, myself. Because right. a hang-up I had when I was first diagnosed is I felt, I felt responsible for what was happening to me. Yes, that might be a woman thing that we're conditioned maybe yeah. to feel that way. Like, I'm sorry. I started, I had a, a New Year's resolution like 2018 to just stop apologizing for my physical condition because yes. especially to doctors because that's literally why they're there to help, you know, to help you. Yes, yes. So like, I'm sorry I'm here presenting these symptoms for you to do your job, which is to help me manage yes. them. But. And if my labs looked bad, I felt like I had failed a test or something. I that yes. So as soon as I got over that, which was not easy, things became a lot uh, better for me. It was about partnering with your doctor to attack this external thing. I mean, that may be internally to your body, but not like internal to your being. Totally. <laughs> as I matured as a patient, for mm-hmm. lack of a better term, yeah. and, and, and advocating for myself, um, I also became um, unapologetic about asking for second opinions and for additional um, expert resources. Mm-hmm. And that is one of my biggest regrets that I didn't do that sooner. My The inflammation in my wrists, in particular my right wrist, was really getting out of control. Mm-hmm. And I I wasn't yet um, aware of the other um, medical resources that might have been available to me in terms of like hand specialists yeah, and, and yeah. managing that pain with proper splinting. What I didn't realize is that um, because, and I, I do sort of hold my doctors a bit accountable for this, is I didn't realize that with all this um, chronic inflammation, the joint was getting damaged. When I finally went and saw a hand specialist, um, my um, joint was pretty much toast. I had no idea that part of the reason why I was in so much pain was because literally there was there was no um, cartilage left and that it was all just like bone on bone at that yeah, point. You had never had an x-ray. Uh, I had, but oh, or... the, it just had been, the inflammation had been so oh. great for so long. I had had um, a cortisone injection in mm-hmm. the wrist not that long uh, prior, but it wow. just um, degraded pretty darn quickly and was undergoing an auto fusion. So wow. what that means is it was fusing itself. Right. I didn't have to have surgery, but I did have to wear this for custom. <laughs> this custom splint for seven months wow. to hold it uh, and sleep in it um, to hold it's a little dusty because I haven't been wearing it anymore um, <laughs> while the the joint completed its complete auto um, uh, fusion yeah. um, but I will tell you as somebody who otherwise has uh, an invisible illness yeah Wearing this puppy um, totally changed my experience in the world as someone with a chronic illness because mm-hmm. it no longer became invisible. It became visible. Right. And the general public, when they see a woman in her early 30s walking around with this big thing in the Pacific Northwest, oh, did you hurt yourself skiing? Oh, yeah. did you do any number of things? Just fun things that you probably can't do yes. because of your arthritis. And complete strangers, complete strangers would come up and talk to me and I'd be like, well, hello, a grocery store clerk. Let me tell you about my detailed medical history. Mm-hmm.